on my computer. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, missed you last. It was only me and Marshall last Wednesday, so we didn't end up recording that, which is totally fine. Um, uh, but missed you last Thursday because I was out. Um, hope you guys had a good weekend. But we will um, be looking at kind of some of the reasons why we're focused on nonfiction text rather than fictional text. So we're going to look, look at a couple of videos on that. If you want to take some notes on that, uh, if you have some um, notebook um, or paper handy, that would be smart to do that. Um, then we're going to practice what we did a couple of, I think it was the beginning of last week, an exercise, uh, exercise on IXL that is specific to nonfiction. And we're gonna do it kind of middle grades. And then um, I'm gonna have you guys work on that on your off time um, as best you can leading up to the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. Sheila is popping in. Good, good, good. Let me get Sheila down and we'll get started. This class keeps it getting bigger and bigger. I like it. Good. How's math going? Can you give me some math information? I'm done with math. So. <laughs> done with math. Good. I say it's going. Comes down to math, my friend. It's going. It's going. It's going. You you sound so excited about math. <laughs> I'm glad that we uh, we're not doing any of that today. All right. So I want to show you these a um, couple quick little videos about. Um, about nonfiction and why we're specifically looking at nonfiction and how that's going to help us in uh, in the end. Let's look at this one. All right, so I'm sharing screen. You can see that. I will make this smaller. All right, now you can see it, I hope. All right, so let's look real quick. We are going to get just a couple of videos on reasons why we're looking at nonfiction or informative text. Text educates the reader I'll bring about it back to the specific. beginning. Hey guys, welcome to the You guys can see all this, correct? Yes. Informative text is writing that provides information, but it's not only does informative text have its own style, but there are four types of informative text. We'll go over that and more in this video. Let's start by answering the question. Informative text educates the reader about a specific topic. It's a unique type of writing. You'll see it in a number of different mediums. A manual with instructions for putting together a desk, a book that provides information on a vacation to a specific place, a nonfiction book that examines World War II. All are examples of informative texts. Informative texts can appear in newspapers, textbooks, reference materials, and research papers. Informative text is always non fiction. This type of writing also has certain characteristics that make this style easier to identify. Let's take a look at those. Informative text contains a number of aids that make it easier for readers to follow along and get the information they need. Written cues, graphics, illustrations, and organizational structure are all aids you'll find in So that's huge for us to see that, especially the graphics and illustrations, um, and anything associated with graphics, charts, uh, those visuals, uh, as I want to call them, in the articles you read on text. Um, we'll start by GD looking at will be written huge. cues. You'll notice these written cues in books. The table of contents at the front of the book makes it easy for readers to quickly see where they can find specific information. The index found at the end of the book neatly lists all of the topics and the page numbers that denote the location of those topics. If you're confused by what a word or phrase means, you can check the glossary of terms, which provides those definitions. There might even be an appendix, which provides additional informative text on a specific subject. So how is this informative text organized? 
Informative text uses types, fonts, and labels to help readers find information. A bold word creates emphasis and tells reader this is important. A phrase set in italics is similar. It adds extra emphasis on an important word or a phrase. Numbered or bulleted lists set apart important information in an orderly fashion. Authors might use headings, subheadings, and labels to also denote importance. Those are all ways informative text can organize content. What other techniques do authors use? Informative text may contain graphics to help the reader understand the subject. Think of a biology book you've recently used. When studying the human body, you'll see a diagram that shows the location of vital organs and systems, like the brain, heart, and lungs. That's an example of it shows you the information while providing some explanatory text. In math books, you'll see charts that explain how to analyze algebraic equations. You'll find tables that explain the periodic table of elements. Those maps that show the location of countries, that's also informative. Flow diagrams, sketches, and maps are all examples of other graphics used in informative texts but graphics aren't the only visual aids. Illustrations provide additional visual techniques in informative text. In the graphic section, I use the example of how authors can graphically represent the brain, heart, and lungs. With illustrations, we can take that one step further. For example, you can focus on one part of the heart by magnifying a specific area. That gives the reader even more information and the ability to study the pulmonary artery, the aorta, or the ventricles in greater detail. Photos are also used for illustrative purposes, written cues, organization, graphics, illustrations. Those are all the characteristics of informative texts. Now, let's take a look at the four different types of informative text. Books can be excellent sources of informative text. Biographies on historical figures fall under the informative category. Technical books on computer software are also informative. So are picture books on astronomy or the earth. Literary nonfiction like memoirs, essays, and autobiographies also fall into these categories. While poetry is known for its illusion, this style of literature also lends itself to informative writing so long as the poetry contains factual information. This type of informative literary nonfiction tends to be shorter. Expository writing has a different set of characteristics. Expository writing has those written cues we discussed at the beginning of the video. These books contain a table of contents, an index, and a glossary. These are all tools that let readers scan through material and pick what they want to read. The table of contents organized by chapter gives readers a chance to skip over certain types of information. For example, when reading a book about Earth, you may be fascinated by geology, but not so much by geophysics. The table of contents will guide you to the geology portion of the book. Babe Ruth is the greatest baseball player to ever live. Global warming is not fake. Dogs are better than cats. These are all argumentative positions, and the author must try to persuade the reader through data and analysis. The author produces the claims, makes the arguments, and hopes that readers believe he's right in the end. The last type of informative text is much different from the argumentative style. Procedural texts provide a step-by-step -step guide for a user. A cookbook is a good example of a procedural text. The recipes provide an ingredient by ingredient guide to create a specific dish. If you're hanging a television using a wall mount, the mount will come with step-by-step -step instructions. If you're putting something together, chances are you're looking at procedural writing. So those are the four types of informative writing. Literary nonfiction, which tends to be shorter writing, expository writing, which has written cues that make it easier for readers to scan information, argumentative or persuasive writing, which advocates a point of view, and procedural writing, a step-by-step -step guide. That's our look at informative text, the writing technique that seeks to inform with facts. I hope that this overview was helpful. If you enjoyed it, then be sure to give us a thumbs up. And yeah, all the thumbs up. All right, so I can, uh, let me unmute everybody. I'll ask to unmute. 
So uh, why do you think we are focused on nonfiction or why do you think we focus on informative texts? Why we would spend time on that? Anyone? Um, thinking. <laughs> so when we're looking at the three sections of the GD that we look at, uh, science, social studies, and language arts, at least three quarters of it. So 75%, three out of every four articles on there will be about or be nonfiction or uh, informational text. That's why we give you um, New ZLA all the time. And I need to do a better job of assigning you one every day to, to, to go for and then uh, can move on to that. So let's look at one more. <laughs> And then we're going to uh, do some practicing. Okay, so I will mute everybody. And then we will look at one more. All right, so I wanted to look at this one. About force direction. Do we read informational text in the same way we read fiction in some ways? Yes. Think of it this way. Once a child learns to toss a ball, she has some basic skills about force, direction, and follow through that can be used whether the object is a football or a baseball. The same is true of reading. Once I understand how decoding works and realize that the author is going to give me a certain amount of information and that I have to bring my experience of the world and my experience of the topic to help me make sense of it, then I can use that approach with any text. But now let's say the object that's being tossed is a Frisbee. Some of the same principles of throwing still apply. But since a Frisbee isn't shaped like a ball, some things must change. The same is true when I pick up an informational text. There are just enough differences that I need to change some things. So what are the differences? Perhaps the biggest difference is the role of background knowledge. When we pick up fiction, we're entering an imaginary world that no one save the author knows anything about. We don't have to bring any knowledge about Quidditch or about strange communities with no memories to bear upon our reading. But when we pick up an informational text, our understanding of that text is highly influenced by what we already know. When students say of an informational text, this is hard. They might not mean that the syntax or the vocabulary is difficult. They often mean that because of limited knowledge about this topic, their ability to understand what the author is saying is also limited. This becomes more problematic as the content becomes more specific, the content we expect students to master in high school and college. Another difference is our stance in reading informational texts. When we read fiction, we're following where the author takes us, and we often get caught up in a story. When we read informational texts, we're required to be very focused and to carefully build knowledge on the topic. That's why students who don't have background knowledge or don't see the purpose for reading a text can get so frustrated. Another difference resides in the questions we want to ask ourselves as we read. When I'm reading fiction, I want to ask, why is the character doing that? Why did the setting shift? What's the conflict? And how does its resolution help me understand the theme? When I'm reading informational texts, I want to ask myself, who's the author? And what's that person's perspective? Whose viewpoint has not been presented in this text? Those questions obviously push the reader back into the text. As a reader, I want to ask myself, okay, if those views had been there, what might their perspective have been? When we read informational texts, we also want to ask ourselves, 
Are there other conclusions or interpretations that could be justified by the evidence? Did the author provide evidence for his conclusions, or is he letting his opinion stand for fact? When I look at his evidence, I need to ask myself, does this evidence seem logical and fair, or does it seem one-sided? It's fine if an author of informational text chooses to present only one side of an argument, but he needs to be clear that this is all he's doing. This is especially important for our younger readers. Most importantly, when reading informational text, I want to ask myself, how has this author changed what I now understand? How is what I'm reading similar or not similar to what I've already heard or what I've already read? And generally, if I can get kids to think about those questions, I've created engaged readers. All right, so I'll stop sharing real quick again. And ask everybody to unmute. So when you're reading a passage on, let's say, your what I wish and hope you would be practicing on daily, News ELA. When you're reading an article on News ELA, how many times should you how many times should you be reading it? At least three times. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that was <laughs> somebody said three times. At least three times. I think that's a really good number to start with for sure. At least two or three times. Um, this is the reason why on News ELA you have all the Lexile level. Start low then go medium and then go to max if you can. That's really, I think, going to be your best bet um, and the best practice that you can for the GED um, to really get the most comprehension that you can from each nonfiction or informative writing that you, uh, or article that you see. So I'm gonna share out again to IXL now. Now I have a question. When we're reading these passages, should we be kind of skimming, reading in between the lines when we read them three times? Skimming? No, I we don't recommend that you ever skim. Okay. Um, I'm all, I'm a little jealous of those who can skim. I talked a little bit last week about uh, just personally. I'm I'm not the most fluent or fast reader. I literally read. And you can see this, this is just an example from um, News ELA that you guys, I assigned this. Some of you guys looked at it, some of you did not, which is fine. Um, yeah, I would read every word, okay. take your time, analyze things, highlight things that are important. You're starting, I, I think one of the biggest differences between reading fictional, where you can sit and read, uh, like, a Her like they gave you example, Harry Potter, and kind of like fall into it as if it's a movie, you don't have to think too much about it. When you're reading yeah. these nonfiction articles, you're gonna be asked something at the end, four different questions. You're gonna to wanna to know what, uh, or at least have, uh, have been extracting the most amount of information that you can while you're reading. Um, so numbers are huge. These visuals with captions are huge. If I was writing the test on this, I'd write something about that caption because how many of us read through this? We see this, like, you know, picture of somebody who's walking around with an ice cream in their pocket and they can't, and that's apparently a legal law, um, but they don't read this and this might be some important information or you see, uh, again, uh, any sort of visual chart, gram, diagram, graph. Those are very, very important for sure. Um, but that's New ELA, which I, I hope you guys are maintaining it and trying that the best you can. So let's go to IXL though for a second. I wanted to re-hit at the sixth grade level. Um, I believe it's the last section in, which one is it? The last section in, where is it? Oh, uh, it's not the last section. And analyzing informational text. So we're at the just the sixth grade. So you guys are going to help me out with this, hopefully. And then I want you to on your own time, whether you're starting at, I don't care if you're starting at kindergarten, start there first and then move. We want to end up with 
uh, hitting this section, analyzing informational texts, which is in the reading strategies. Um, we want you to hit that at the high school level. Um, uh, I think that is as important as it gets, especially because 75% of the stuff you're going to see on GED is going to be nonfiction. Okay. Almost a hundred percent is on, uh, science and social studies. So let's read through this. Uh, do I have any, any readers that would like to volunteers? I mean, Anyone? Do you want us to read like one paragraph at a time? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, and I'll just scroll down. That's one thing I don't okay. like in this section. You have to do some scrolling. So, one stormy day, 12 year old Arjun Kumar was late getting home from school. It had been raining heavily near his school in Chennai, India. This delayed his school bus, and when he finally arrived, Arjun's parents were worried and all right, somebody else want to hit it up? All right, his parents' concern gave Arjun uh, an idea. He'd, writ he'd write an app. An app or an application is a software program that tells an electronic device how to do a certain task. Most of Arjun's classmates and their parents own smartphones. The apps on these devices enable them to do many things, get directions to a store, connect to online uh, games, share photos, or track sp uh, sports scores. Somebody wanna hit three? A lot. I got it. A lot of volunteers. <laughs> um, but there wasn't an app to tell parents the location of their children's school bus. Ajun decided to create one himself. He had loved technology since he was a toddler. Back then, his parents piled was cushions on a chair so Arjun could reach the computer. He'd recently started writing computer programs, so he felt ready to tackle an app. All right. Number four, anyone? That's a short yes. um, While researching different ways to write apps, Arjun located an online programming tool on the website of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. MIT was making the tool called App Inventor, available free to anyone who wanted to use it. All right, using App Invent, uh, Inventor, Arjun's, uh, Arjun created an app for schools, parents, and students, which he named Easy School Bus Locator. Uh, if, a, if a school incorporated this app into its bus system, parents could log on to see the location of estimated arrival times of their children's school buses. Like other map, uh, mapping apps, Easy School Bus Locator relied on global positioning systems or GPS. GPS helps uh, users determine their location based on signals from a set of 24 satellites that orbit the Earth. GPS-based apps calculate the location of a device by, measure, by measuring the distance from the three different GPS satellites, from three different GPS satellites. That's how our June uh, app determined where the buses were located. All right, the app could also confirm whether individual children were on the bus. Easy school bus locator used a specific barcode, a pattern of parallel lines to identify each student, just as the barcode on a product label identify the product and the price when the cashier scan, scans it at the checkout counter, the student barcodes identify individual students. Students checked in when they got on and off the bus by using barcodes on their phones. As the bus uh, driver drove, the app sent automatic messages to the parents and guardians. Somebody want to hit number seven? A lot, a lot of volunteering. Today. I can. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You can go ahead if you want. Go oh, ahead. I don't. <laughs> Does easy school bus locator sound like a good idea? MIT thought so. In 2012, MIT held a contest to honor the best apps 
that have been created using App Inventor. Anjan's, Anjan's app won first place in the K K through eight division, and Anjan convinced his school to try the app that same year. In 2013, the app was available for purchase online. All right, our our June's. Our June didn't stop there. Since 2013, he has updated the application and worked to make it avail uh, available free of charge. Our June also continued developing new apps, in, uh, including one that links people who need needed help after a flood with volunteers who wanted to help them. He even started his own software development company. When asked for pointers for other young inventors, our June ad advised. Look for problems around you and get inspired from them. You'll see a lot of opportunities to use your skills to make this world a better place to live, okay? Now, we have eight paragraphs there, pretty lengthy um, uh, little passage. I wish it was not under that thing. I wish it was the full thing that you could see like on uh, News ELA, but either way, we're looking about kind of probably the main idea here. What is the text about? It is about the rainy day weather in India and how it affects tra uh, traffic. Is it about students' invention of a bus locator application, or it's about the life of an inventor, Arjun Kumar. What's I'd our number two? What's our best? Second eight? one. Yeah, number one is too specific, and this is kind of too broad, and it's just not accurate. So we're looking at um, uh, B or number two, the second one. I mean. All right, so based on the text, what inspired Arjun to write uh, the school bus app, uh, school bus loca locator app? Uh, his parents were worried when his bus was delayed. He was dissatisfied with the number of apps on his phone, star smartphone, or he was looking for a way to win a technology award. The first one? Yeah, these two are kind of bogus. Um, you didn't get that really from even just one reading of the text. Excellent, wonderful. All right, so based on, based on what, what was the, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Turner, what was the answer for the number, the first one? The very, what do you mean? The very first question? The first question, yes. I wonder, I don't think I can go back. Oh, I think it was number okay. two. It was the, the second, second one. I know, I know it was like, okay. all right. Based on the text, what are the two technologies that Easy Bus locate, uh, Locator use? You use GPS to allow parents to track um, the bus's location. You use video chatting to allow students and parents to communicate or use a barcode, used barcodes to keep track of which children were on board, which two? GPS number and one. barcodes. Definitely number one and number three. Number three. I, didn't, number two. I didn't see anything yeah, about video chatting video um, no like the zooming we're doing right now we couldn't do or i couldn't record if i was doing that at the k-12 level if that makes sense because you are not allowed to uh, i guess distribute even if a student speaks in the zoom you can't record uh, we're different we're a college so all right last question based on the text what was arjun kumar's primary motivation so we're looking at primary motivation for working on software development he wanted to uh earn money to continue his education at mit he wanted to win many awards for his inventions or he wanted to solve problems that he saw in the world the last one it is going to be the last number one. number three he wasn't in I'm MIT, it sounds like. Uh, he wanted uh, to win many awards. No, I don't think he was looking to do that. He saw a problem and, and wanted to fix it. Okay, brilliant. All right, so let's look at this one. The secret of the Brazilian pepper tree. Sounds interesting. The Brazilian pepper tree, and this is the scientific name, Skinnis terabithifolius, uh, <laughs> grows throughout Florida where it's considered a noxious weed. The pepper tree, which has red berries and green leaves all winter long, is commonly called the Christmas berry or Florida holly. Starting around 1840, people brought the pepper tree from South, a South America to Florida as a decorative garden plant. However, it soon escaped the gardens. 
It has since spread widely and crowded out many of Florida's native mangrove and pine trees. Some scientists believe the pepper tree produces a chemical that prevents native trees from growing nearby. Experts in Florida have recommended removing pepper trees to protect nat and native plants. Somebody want to hit number two? I got two. Right. Um, however, the pepper tree also, however, the pepper tree also has a long history of medicinal use in areas of South South America where the pepper tree grows naturally. People have used it, its leaves, barks, berries, and seeds to treat various mal maladies, including colds, ulcers, and infections. More recently, a research team from Emory University may have discovered yet another promising use for the pepper tree. The team was led, oh, led by Professor Cassandra Quave, a specialist in ethnobotany. Ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is a study of how indigenous populations use local plants, local plants. Knowing how useful the pepper tree has been to people in South America, she decided to take a closer look at, at this weed. Quote unquote weed, yeah. Okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe we need that for Corona. Kwame's <laughs> research team uh, separated the chemical ingredients within the berries and tested each ingredient against a range of infections. Their experiments confirmed that the pepper tree berries contain a substance that works against certain bacteria. This substance appeared to fight an antibiotic resistant strain of Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus uh, bacteria cause staph infections, uh, producing symptoms such as skin sores, pneumonia, bone and joint inflammation. Severe staph infections are treated with antibiotic drugs. However, certain Staphylococcus uh, strains, including Staphylococcus aureus, um, have uh, developed resistance to those drugs. Infections from antibiotic resistant bacteria are difficult to treat and can be deadly. This makes the pepper tree berry particularly noteworthy. Somebody want to hit number four? There's experiments involved giving the pepper berry substance to mice infected with antibiotic resistant. Yeah. This yeah. treatment appeared to reduce the formation of foils and other skin sores that infected mice would normally develop. The researchers also found that the berry compound itself caused no harm to the skin. Further, the normal healthy bacteria present on the skin were not infected. This was all the it was all good news. Anyone want to read number five? The researchers then investigated how the berry substance caught Staphylococcus aureus infection in the, in the mice. Rather than killing the bacteria, the berry chemical appeared to, pre to prevent individual bacteria cells from communicating with one another. When the communication was blocked, the bacteria did not act as they usually would in this serious infection. Normally, the bacteria cells would produce toxins or poisons which damage the tissues of the infected host. With the berries suppressing the toxins, the, the mouse immune system could fight off the infection. The stores could heal. All right, and number six or six paragraph. Scientists uh, will have to investigate further into the berries staff fighting abilities. Ideally, they'll be able to develop treatments for human patients, but, the fa uh, but they face more work ahead before they can determine whether these medicines would work and be safe for people. There's one step the researchers no, won't be difficult. Um, collecting berries for experiments. Brazilian pepper trees are easy to find. After all, they grow like weeds. Okay. All right. So now we're being going to be asked that main idea question. What is this text about? 
It is about how the Brazilian pepper uh, tree berry may help fight staph infections. It is about the cause and effect of cat staphylococcus infections in humans and mice. It is about why Brazilian pepper trees need to be eliminated to protect native Florida trees. I'm sorry, native trees in Florida which is the main thrust of the idea. Number one. Definitely number one. Number two, number three is in paragraph one for a second. And I, we talked very, very, very little about staphylococcus and how that affects humans and mice. Next one. Based on the text, why do some people in Florida consider the Brazilian pepper tree a harmful weed? Number one, or A, it keeps... Uh, it's leaves and berries all winter, attracting birds to make a mess. I didn't read any of that. Uh, it has taken over Florida's garden plots and playgrounds and golf courses. <laughs> 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 Just those areas. I didn't read any of that. So uh, we're going to conclude it at C, but let's read it. It has spread into pine and mangrove areas and crowded out native plants. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going yeah, to go with answer number C. I mean, letter C. <laughs> it only affects golf courses. Um, based on the text, what two discoveries did Professor Quave, Quave's team make? A, a substance in berries, and we're, we're looking at two discoveries. Substance in berries blocked communication between individual bacteria cells, um, treat treatment with berry substance appeared to promote recovery from staph, infection, uh, staph infections in mice. The pepper tree berries were able to kill the staphylococcus bacteria. This is not an easy um, one. I would say number two. So it, it's definitely, we're gonna look at, number one was discussed uh, in paragraph, the last or the second and last paragraph. Where is it? The bacteria cells from communicating with one another. So yeah, that's blocked the communication between an individual. And then you say number number uh, letter B, treatment yeah. of berry substance appears to promote recovery from staph of staph infections in mice or um, the pepper tree berries were able to kill staphylococcus. Um, because it says in the last sentence that it suppresses the toxin yeah. and it helps your immune system to fight off infection. Very good, yeah. And then this sentence also combats this one that says, rather than killing the bacteria, the berry, the berry chemical appears to prevent individual bacteria cells from communicating. Interesting. You got it, sweet. All right, <laughs> so. Based on the text, what is still left to determine about the med uh, about medicine made from pepper tree berries? Whether researchers will be able to find more berries, whether medicines would be safer for humans, or whether people would be willing to buy the medicines. The middle uh, one. B? We're gonna go with B. Yeah, at the very end, it said. It says, after all, they grow like weeds. It's not hard to find them, basically. And then people would be willing to buy the medicine. I didn't hear anything about humans buying anything, people buying medicine. Mm -mm. All right, so keep it up. Sweet. All right, so what are we on in time? Oh, we got to call it. So what I want you guys to do is, I'm going to go to language arts, and I'll look at the different, like, let, let's look at kindergarten. Let's see if they have it. No, that's going to be, it's got to be after kindergarten. So first grade, maybe they have it. No, 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 no. Like maybe it's after third grade. So starting, I think, with third grade and then moving all the way to 12. So you have all these different texts, informational texts, okay? Informational text level one and two, okay? You can read about animals, food. We looked at these last time, I believe, okay? Galapagos Island, all that, okay? Reading about animals specifically. Um, that's informational text, so it's the, it's that last, uh, sometimes the last section you have to look for it, informational text. Look at that compared to 12, 12th grade in analyzing informational text, okay? They're looking at a, a set of one, two sets of articles to look at. It gets pretty, 
pretty difficult stuff here. If you can get to that ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade sections, I'm gonna stop sharing real quick. You're gonna be uh, really completing what I want you to be completing. Um, being able to read informational or nonfiction text, answer questions about that, get that reading comprehension. It's different than wearing, uh, reading Harry Potter and falling into and letting yourself be led sort of by a leash on the story. You have to take control of the story and control of the information uh, and retain that information. So questions, comments for me? No. No? I think I have some new people in here. I didn't get Mariah. If there's no questions, comments for me, you guys have uh, eight minutes to get a little break before you have to start with your really super amazing fun math teachers. Well, math subject. Yay. Yay. If you have any questions or you want to stay on, I'll be on for a couple of minutes. But if not, you guys are gold. Yes, Pam. Yay, good night. Good night. Good All right, guys, we'll see you. We'll see you Bye. Thursday, all right? Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Adios, amigos. I'll see you later, Marsh.